Dear distinguished guests, colleagues, students, welcome to the third William J. Perry Lecture held in association with Iwa Graduate School of International Studies Distinguished Global Lecture Series. My name is Lin Pyeon, an associate professor at the Graduate School of International Studies who will be serving as an MC today. 안녕하세요. 이화여대 국제대학원의 Distinguished Global Lecture Series의 일환으로 주최되는 제 3차 윌리엄 페리 렉처에 참석하신 여러분을 환영합니다. 저는 오늘 사회를 맡게 된 국제대학원 국제학과 변인수 교수입니다. First, we'd like to express a special thanks to President Spencer Kim, the founder of the Pacific Century Institute, for the generous support that made today's lecture possible. Also, I'd like to mention that a simultaneous translation service will be provided thanks to the support of Iwa Unification Education Initiative, Channel 7 Airs Korean. 본 행사를 후원해 주신 태평양 세기 연구소의 창립자이신 스펜서 김 회장님께 특별한 감사를 표합니다. 그리고 이화 통일 교육 선도 사업단의 지원으로 오늘 행사에 동시 통역 서비스가 제공됨을 말씀드리고자 합니다. 채널 7번이 한국어입니다. Then, without further ado, let me introduce to you the president of IHWA and former Graduate School of International Studies Dean, our dear Eunmi Kim, who will deliver the welcoming remarks. 그러면 이화여대 총 이화여대 김은미 총장님께서 환영사를 해주시겠습니다. 박수로 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Sigrid uh, Hecker, Her, Her Excellency, I think she's not here yet, uh, but she's coming. Her Excellency Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, uh, Mr. Spencer Kim from the Pacific Century Institute and members of the PCI board, distinguished guest students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the William J. Perry Lecture Series. We're honored to have Dr. Sigrid uh, Hecker as our distinguished speaker today. I would like to take a few moments to introduce the William J. Perry Lecture Series and the Pacific Century Institute, which has brought the William J. Perry Lecture Series to Iwa Women's University in 2021. First, our sincere gratitude goes to the Pacific Century Institute, which has generously sponsored the William J. Perry Lecture Series. The Pacific Century Institute is a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles, California, in the United States, focusing on building bridges between countries and people in the Pacific Rim. It was initially founded in Louisville, Kentucky, during the mid 1980s by the late Ronald uh, McLaurin, Dr. Stephen Haggard, Dr. Chung In Moon, Spencer Kim, and Kenneth Tuggle. In the PCI homepage, it reads, quote, while Louisville was clearly not part of the Pacific Rim, the founders had a great interest in the region and understood that what happens in this part of the world impacts the rest of the globe, end quote. I'm particularly grateful to Mr. Spencer Kim, co-founder of PCI, and President Raymond Burgard for bringing the William J. Perry Lecture Series to IHWA. William J. Perry was the 19th United States Secretary of Defense who served under President Bill Clinton from 1994 to 1997. In the aftermath of the Cold War, William J. Perry traveled extensively around the world more than any previous secretary during his three-year tenure to redesign U.S. foreign policy, although he was not the Secretary of State. For the Korean Peninsula, he played a critical role in signing of the October 21, 1994 agreed framework in Switzerland when the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and other regional allies promised to provide North Korea with two light water nuclear reactors to replace existing or partially constructed facilities that could produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. This was a critical milestone with the hope of an eventual denuclearization and peace on the Korean Peninsula. 
In 1999, after his tenure as Secretary of Defense, he was appointed as Special Envoy of North Korea and chaired the team that wrote the review of United States policy toward North Korea, which was in short called the Perry Process, a three-stage process to bring about peace on the Korean Peninsula. In recognition of his outstanding achievements of and in admiration for his commitment toward building peace on the Korean Peninsula, the Pacific Century Institute created the William J. Perry Lecture Series in 2016 and brought the lecture series to IHWA in 2021. The William J. Perry Lecture Series brings outstanding professionals in various fields who have answered their country's call to government service and returned to their chosen professions to provide insights on global challenges and leadership to next generation leaders like you. The series is co-organized by the Iwa Graduate School of International Studies as part of its distinguished global lecture series. In 2021, Her Excellency Janet Napolitano was invited as a distinguished speaker. She was the first female U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security. The title of her speech was Prepare to Lead, Today's Challenges for Tomorrow's Leaders. A Janet Napolitano scholarship was created at IHWA GSIS with a generous gift from Mr. Spencer Kemp and Her Excellency Janet Napolitano. We're grateful for this prestigious scholarship, which has helped students from developing countries with an opportunity for postgraduate studies. In 2022, Her Excellency Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Korea from 2008 to 2011, and President and CEO of KEI, was the distinguished speaker. The title of her speech was Gender in Politics and Diplomacy, American and Korean Perspectives. As a way of introducing the William J. Perry Lecture Series, IHWA's PR team has prepared a short video. I hope you will enjoy it. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. So next, um, our uh, Scranton Dean, uh, Inhee Park, will come up and introduce today's speaker. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Inhee Park uh, at the uh, Division of International Studies uh, and also Dean of the Scranton College. Uh, this is my great, great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Jigufred uh, Hecker who is globally well-known uh, uh, expert in terms of the nuclear energy and in terms of nuclear technology. 
but also I, I definitely say that he is most prestigious uh, scientist and, and policy makers in, in terms of the North Korean nuclear program based on his uh, research and also based on his uh, visit to Pyongyang and also based on his taking a close look at the facilities uh, of designed by North Korean people. Um, he is very popular among the, the people in academia who are doing international security, including myself. But uh, just in case someone who are not familiar with Dr. Hacker, uh, one of the easiest way to introduce him is, I know many of you seen one of the uh, recent movie under the title of the Oppenheimer. Uh, when uh, Oppenheimer was designing and developing nuclear program, nuclear bombs, he was the first director of the Los Alamos uh, National Lab located in New Mexico. And uh, Dr. Echo was the same position director the years during 86 to 97. So he is the, you know, the someone in that uh, area. Um, his family is originally from uh, Australia and came to uh, the state with his whole family. And he did his, Dr. Hacker did his final degree at uh, Case Western University in the area of the metal engineering. Uh, I cannot even count how many, you know, uh, awards and medals that he received. If I have to point out only two things, uh, he got received. Uh, National Engineering Award from the American Association of Engineering Societies in the year 2018. And most importantly, he received uh, Enrico Peremi Award uh, in the year 2009, uh, which is the most prestigious award regarding the area of energy. Uh, currently, he is a uh, Stanford University Professor Emeritus in the Department of the Management Science and Engineering. And also, he has a, another job position at Stanford under the title of the Senior Fellow Emeritus at the Freeman uh, Spogler Institute for International Studies. Uh, out of uh, many publications and books, he, uh, as the President Kim mentioned, recently published a book under the title of The Hinge Point on Inside, look at North Korea's nuclear program, uh, obviously based in his own uh, insight and research uh, regarding North Korean nuclear program. Um, well, uh, he, as he point, clearly pointed out in his book, uh, he emphasized the importance of the peaceful and uh, diplomatic negotiation to permanently handle uh, North Korean nuclear program. Uh, even though, as you all know, currently the international circumstance is changing, uh, in particular, you know, Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia and, and Pres Putin's visit to Shanghai to meet uh, Xi Jinping, etc., etc. But uh, simultaneously, we never give up peaceful resolution and a diplomatic option uh, to completely handle North Korean problem. Uh, let me speak out the last part in Korean. Hacker Iwan은 우리 이화 여자 대학교는 최초의 순간부터 137년 최초의 순간부터 평화, 공존 그리고 인권 어, 박해 정신을 바탕으로 하고 있습니다. 아, 북한 문제에 대한 평화로운 해법을 주장하신 해커 박사님의 어, 정신과 노력은 이와 가지고 있는 고귀한 정신과 맞닿아 있어서 오늘의 행사가 더 의미 있을 것으로 생각됩니다. Okay, let me invite His Excellency Dr. Hacker to the podium. Let's show our warm welcoming. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here at Iwa University. Uh, it's my first time here at Iwa. Of course, I've been in Seoul and South Korea a number of times, including, as which just was said, I've also been in North Korea uh, a number of times. Uh, just a, a slight correction, if, if you don't mind, because uh, all of my friends in Austria will never forgive me that I grew up in Austria and, and not Australia. <laughs> uh, and, and in addition, um, 
uh, I've retired from Los Alamos. Uh, I've retired from Stanford. But I'm not retired. And so, and the reason is, actually, as I look out at all the young faces, it's because of you. It's because of the students. So I, I'm now working with the Middlebury Institute in Monterey. They have a very, very, very nice international program. Uh, and in nuclear engineering at Texas A&M uh, University. So that's my, my full title at this point. It, it is indeed my great pleasure uh, to give the Perry Lecture. And indeed, uh, and, and here is uh, William Perry uh, with President Clinton. And he's reporting uh, on what was called the Perry Process, it was mentioned. And, and to me, uh, that was sort of the last time that one really engaged and looked at the North Korea problem in a holistic way as to what needs to be done. Uh, and uh, at that time, he was Professor Perry. He was ex-Secretary of Defense. Uh, and he looked at this problem of North Korea, and he came back and said, let's make sure we deal with North Korea the way it is, not the way that we would like it to be. Uh, and, and for those of you students, if you go back and you look at the report from the Perry process, uh, it makes so much sense. I, I was still at Los Alamos uh, at the time, but then I went to Stanford in 2005, uh, and uh, here is uh, Professor Perry uh, on the left uh, at, at Stanford. And so I had the great pleasure of teaching with him. It might seem peculiar to you now, but he brought me in as the young guy to sort of take over uh, the classes uh, that he was uh, teaching. And so he was a superb Secretary of Defense. He was a great diplomat. Uh, and particularly, he, he was a terrific educator. That's where his real love was. And, and he did that at Stanford uh, University. He, he's still uh, living today uh, and, and actually doing quite well. So it, it is a particular pleasure. So it turns out I gave a, a Perry lecture. So I was honored uh, with that once. Uh, and that is back uh, in 2018. Uh, and this was at, at Yonsei uh, University. Uh, and I titled the lecture, what you see uh, up here, and that is, you know, the DPRK nuclear weapons, a treasured sword, because that's what they called it, uh, or, as I really believed, it was an unnecessary burden uh, to North Korea. And, and I, try, I tried to make that point. In 2018, for those of you who thought and, and studied uh, North Korea, it, it was a time we all had some hope. This was in September 2018. The Singapore summit was in June of 2018. So we had some hope. And that's why I said, you know, this is not a treasured sword. It's really an unnecessary uh, burden. Uh, what's happened since then? Well, not too long after, in February of 2019, there was the Hanoi summit to follow up. And Trump walked away. And I'll come back to that. And then, of course, the COVID restrictions turned North Korea even more inward than they already were. And then I published my book uh, earlier this year. Uh, that's the cover uh, of the English version to try to tell the story, at least from the way that I know it, uh, about North Korea. So what's happened since? Here you can see Kim Jong-un at a defense expo uh, in October 2021. All of these different missiles, all the different armament, uh, armaments, he was building up his nuclear capabilities. And then here, this is 2023, uh, where he went out uh, you know, uh, to sort of do his on-the-spot guidance about the missiles. And all of these missiles there in 2023. So there's been a serious buildup 
uh, of missiles and nuclear weapons. By the way, these, of course, are all mock-ups. You know, they don't have, they would not have Kim Jong-un uh, in there with highly enriched uranium or any of those, but they were trying to send a, a message. And then, you know, you've seen the photos of Kim Jong-un with his daughter at a missile launch, for heaven's sakes, you know, so he's really getting the message across that he's building up his nuclear capabilities. So, what I try to tackle in this book, how did we get here? You know, the 30-year story of North Korea amassing this nuclear arsenal. How did that happen, this little country and the difficulties that we have today? And then I'm here now, and fortunately, Changbi Publishers has just put together and has published the Korean language version of the book. And so I'm trying to give you, so to run you through, obviously in the 40 minutes that I have, I can't give you, you know, chapter and verse of the book, but I'll try to walk you through. So here, here's a quick synopsis. And, and that is, I maintain that in the long history, you know, of North Korea, and particularly the difficult days of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, by 1990, Kim Il-sung decided to seek normalization with the United States to balance against the possibly hostile China and Russia. And as you know, at that time, the Cold War was clearly coming to an end. South Korea had risen to a significant economic power, and Kim Jong-un made the decision that perhaps it's best to align and try to normalize with the United States. And then what I try to show in the book is that in my opinion, uh, he chose uh, to develop what I call a dual track policy. So seek normalization through diplomacy, but and develop a nuclear arsenal in case diplomacy failed. And so he ran both of these tracks, not just one or the other, but both of them. He never gave up any of those, as well I, sh I will show you. All three Kims followed that policy. One or the other was either up or down, but he f they followed both of those tracks. And that's what one has to understand. Next. So they followed that policy, pursue both, not one or the other. Uh, and as the nuclear and missile program developed over the years, as they made advances, then that led to confrontation with the United States. You used, the government called it provocations. It was really part of the overall plan. And this led to various, what I call, hinge points, sort of key decision points, where then the governments had to make a decision as to what do you do about the fact that Kim has now launched a rocket or launched a missile or did a nuclear test, what do you do? So at those hinge points, one has to make a decision. And then what I try to show in the book is that the Bush administrations, you know, so from uh, 2001 on, then the Obama administration and the Trump administration, they all failed. They made the wrong decisions at these hinge points. And since I'm a technical guy who's been, you know, one way or another involved in lots of diplomacy, I've been to Russia many, many times. I've been to China many, many times. I've been to all countries that have declared nuclear weapons programs. And actually, I've been in the nuclear facilities of all of these countries. And so I believe it's essential that one integrates and combines the technical and the diplomatic parts. And if you examine the technical parts, in other words, the risks that we would have taken if we stayed in a particular agreement, the right decisions weren't made. So I say they didn't make technically informed risk management decisions. They were based on politics. And from the US, the US generally of all these years has had such a limited understanding 
uh, of North Korea. And so for the most part, those political decisions were not very good and led in the end. So some people have said, well, I've, I've accused um, you know, the United States of being responsible for the fact that North Korea has built nuclear weapons. That's not what I've said. That's not true. North Korea built those nuclear weapons. What we did in the United States, actually with some help from South Korea at various times, we missed opportunities. And that's what the book is, is about. It, it talks about those opportunities. Uh, and then after those three administrations, the Biden administration has come on and, and essentially has watched Kim Jong-un turn to Russia and China. And I'll come back to that at, at the end. So that, I maintain, then, is another one of these really strategic decisions that Kim Jong-un uh, made just within the last year, or year and a half. Okay, so l let me walk you through that, and, and particularly for the students. Uh, so th th this is my view of how the North Koreans have developed their nuclear capabilities, and the nuclear weapons particularly. Uh, Kim Il-sung uh, uh, started with help from the Soviets. But the Soviets said, we will help you with a peaceful nuclear program. You don't build nuclear weapons. Uh, in the United States, we called it Atoms for Peace. This December 8th will be the 70th anniversary of President Eisenhower's announcement of Atoms for Peace at the United Nations. The Soviets were first very skeptical. They thought it was an American trick, but they got on board pretty quickly. They just called it the Peaceful Atom Program. So we helped countries develop nuclear peaceful capabilities. The United States helped Iran build its first nuclear reactor. That sounds un unbelievable today, but we did. Soviet Union helped North Korea build the first nuclear reactor for peaceful purposes. So that's how it started. But then Kim Il-sung decided he better take a look at whether he can build nuclear weapons himself. He actually tried to get nuclear weapons from the Soviet Union, from China, and they refused. So he began an indigenous program, the Builder Reactor. And so he developed the, what I call the option for the bomb. Uh, and then he agreed in 1994 uh, to actually freeze that program. And, and when you build reactors with reactors, you can make plutonium. Plutonium is sort of the high octane fuel for nuclear bombs. Uh, and so obviously that was important. He agreed uh, to freeze that and he died just before uh, the agreement w was, was actually signed in 1994. His son took over. Uh, he went through with the agreed framework to freeze the, uh, the nuclear programs. Uh, and then, as I will point out later, one of the main hinge points is the Bush administration uh, came in in 2001. Uh, they decided to kill the agreed framework. Uh, North Korea turned around, they started up the nuclear facilities again, made more plutonium, built the bomb, and then tested the bomb. And once you test the bomb, a country has declared it's going the nuclear weapons route. So that was a big deal. Uh, and so the attempts then from the Americans to denuclearize during Kim Jong-il's time uh, failed. Then Kim Jong-un comes on. Uh, and so almost as soon as he took over in December of 2011, there was actually some movement in the Obama administration uh, towards uh, again trying to make a deal. This was the so-called Leap Day deal because it was February 29th of 2012. It failed. Kim Jong-un responded with four more nuclear tests massive missile program, summit diplomacy with Trump, at first, as I said, in um, 2018, it looked promising and then it failed. So, and then he greatly accelerated uh, the nuclear missile program and that's uh, where we are today. So as I look at this then, as I look at the American administrations, I look back and say during the Clinton administration, if we look at the nuclear situation now, so what do I think sort of their challenge was? 
Well, for Clinton it was, don't have North Korea build the bomb. So he signed the agreed framework, and guess what? At the end, uh, he succeeded. They didn't build the bomb during the Clinton administration. However, uh, North Korea built the hedge. Uh, they started the small uranium enrichment program. The uranium is the second path to the bomb uh, besides uh, uh, plutonium. So they, they built the hedge. President Bush came in and not only said they will not build the bomb, so his job was don't let them build the bomb. Well, he failed. So at the end of his administration, North Korea had maybe five or six nuclear weapons in my analysis. They didn't have any successful uh, long-range missile tests, but he failed. Uh, President Obama uh, came in. We had a lot of hope for President Obama. Again, his now, they had the bomb, so his job, as far as I look at it, was don't let them build an arsenal. Don't let this thing get worse. And, you know, denuclearize. See if you can turn them around. Well, he failed. So at the end of his eight years, lo and behold, North Korea has somewhere around 20 to 25 bombs. So that's a pretty miserable record. Okay. Then comes in President Trump. Uh, and his job was turn it around, have him denuclearize. Well, he failed. So at the end of his administration, they have maybe 45 bombs or so, or enough of these fissile materials, plutonium, highly enriched uranium, uh, for bombs. And ICBM tests. Now, not only the short range SCUDs, the medium, you know, the, the medium range uh, Nodong missiles, but ICBM missile tests. And as I'll show you, one of those tests most likely was a hydrogen bomb. I don't have Biden on here yet, but it's also a sad story because they probably can build on the order of six to seven nuclear weapons a year, so now they have 20 more. This is a terrible record from an American standpoint. But now let me say, be, before you say, well, look, these Americans, uh, let me just also make sure that if we look at the South Korean presidents during that time, of course, you've had many more. But we can also say, you, you know, it, it didn't seem to matter whether it was red or blue, whether, it, you know, it was uh, conservative or, or progressive. As we look through all of this, never, never really got there. And so the way that I view this on, on the nuclear side, you know, clearly the Americans had the lead because the North Koreans were looking to the Americans to get normalization with the Americans. From a South Korean standpoint, you know, many of those activities when the South Koreans engaged with the North Koreans, it was more in the, not, in the economic arena and so forth where you had the potential uh, of uh, making some gains. But so we can put it together. So both South Korea, United States, in the end, we failed. So I do want to go just a, a little bit through saying, so how threatening is their nuclear arsenal today? Well, the things that you see in, in, on TV is like this launch of the Wasong A18. Uh, that's an ICBM. It's not only an ICBM, but it's a solid rocket motor ICBM. And those are of much greater concern than the old liquid fuel because uh, the liquid fuel take a long time to fuel the solid rocket motors. You can move them out from where you have them and you can shoot them off. So that's potentially, you know, uh, that's, that's very dangerous. They look a lot like the Russian Topol M uh, or, or the US Minuteman III. So, so these all three are ICBMs, three countries, and so it is quite incredible that this little country, North Korea, uh, has the uh, capability uh, of launching an ICBM. I should say now, and I'll come back to this, all of their ICBM launches uh, are in what we call lofted trajectories. They shoot them high instead of far. And for good technical reasons, you know, I don't think they have the capability to monitor them, them far. So they shoot them high to demonstrate that those missiles have the capability to reach the United States, for example. But they haven't tested them in that mode as of yet. Okay, so how, how do we know? Well, we can see these pictures, but, so I'll quickly run through, through this. 
Uh, and that is, so one way we know, even about a country like North Korea, where you essentially have, essentially, you have no eyes on the ground. So what we do is we have eyes in the sky through satellite. You know, these used to be, we call them spy satellites. Well, today there's commercial you know, satellite imagery that can look at any place on the Earth at incredible details. And so, for example, here in that second picture uh, up on top that shows November 4th, this is when my colleague Bob Carlin, uh, who's here uh, also today, and, and I were there in North Korea. And that was the beginning of a nuclear reactor that was just being built, and they showed it to us. And then what this satellite imagery shows, it shows the progression. And so we could watch from the sky as to when they actually completed the outside. And they did so in about uh, 2013. But they didn't have the reactor operating. So one needs more than satellite imagery. And lo and behold, and here's the really strange part of this, you look from the inside, and that's me in a North Korean plutonium laboratory, uh, all suited up, I'm dressed you know, for, for the kill. That's a plutonium bo uh, glove box uh, on the right. I first worked in a plutonium glove box in Los Alamos in the summer of 1965. I, I was a young student, had just graduated with my bachelor's degree, went to Los Alamos, I worked in those glove boxes, so I knew something about glove boxes, I know something about plutonium. And what they did, they showed me this stuff. They not only showed it to me, but at the end, when I said, okay, that's, you know, it's all very nice. You, you obviously know something about plutonium, but how do I know that that was really plutonium? They said, would you like to see our product? And I said, you mean the plutonium? Uh, and they said, yes. I said, I've seen lots of plutonium in my lifetime, sure, bring it up. So they brought it into a conference room in a glass jar. Actually, it was a marmalade jar <laughs> with a sealed lid. And I held it because plutonium is radioactive, but the glass stops plutonium's radioactivity. And so it's warm still, and it's heavy. Plutonium is very, very heavy. And it was both warm uh, and heavy. So they actually, they showed me the plutonium. So, so that's what one needs. You need some look from the inside, and lo and behold, they showed me this. And I've always been asked, why would they show you the plutonium? I mean, if they're clandestinely building these nuclear weapons. Well, they weren't clandestinely building it. They wanted the Americans to know they've got this dual track strategy. We're gonna build the nuclear weapons. If you, you should talk to us. You know, we wanna get the normalization. That's one of the reasons, I think, why they showed me that. So I had seven visits uh, uh, to the DPRK, uh, four of them to Yangbyun, uh, talked to the technical people doing each of those visits, and, and we learned a lot. And so that's what I describe in, in the book. So what I try to do uh, in this book, is, since not many people get a chance to go to North Korea, almost nobody gets a chance to go inside the nuclear. I want, I try to take the reader, to let the reader see what I saw, to let the reader hear what I heard, to let the reader get a sense of what are these guys like. Well, it turns out they're scientists and their engineers are pretty much like our scientists, or the Russians I've worked with, or the Chinese that I've worked with. The, the bottom line is they're very competent. They're, they're very good engineers. Uh, and so I saw a lot, I learned a lot, and, and the reason I wrote the book is to try to share that. Okay, but they have other things yet where they're still trying to show the world what they do, and that is Kim Jong-un, before him Kim Jong-il, they go around for these inspection tours. Okay, here they are, this thing is called the flow-forming machine, which you need to make centrifuge rotors. And so why do you think they would go ahead, KCNA has that and shows it to us? Because they want us to know that hey, we know how to make these rotors. We also find out actually this machine was made in Spain. And that's one of the North Koreans we're very good at, is how to use the international market to bring in you know, various things. 
they didn't steal the nuclear weapons. They didn't get the nuclear weapons from someone. They built their own nuclear weapons, but they were also smart as to how to get everything that they needed to make the nuclear weapons. Next. This is a most remarkable photo where when in 2017 they did, big, they did the big test, which I'll talk about. They actually, just before the test, they released this photo and said, this is our hydrogen bomb, our two-stage thermonuclear bomb, which is a hydrogen bomb. And here's Kim Jong-un. The person right to the left of him is Director Lee hung sup who I've met several times. And he's the one who showed me around uh, Yang Byun uh, several times. And so they showed this. And for a hydrogen bomb, this you know, would be, um, that's quite small. Whether this is what they tested, we'll never know. Uh, but this is what they showed us. And then behind, they happen to show, you know, part of a missile that's big enough to house that. So they, again, they're sending the message, not only do we have the bomb, but we know how to put it in a missile. So, so this gives us some idea now as to what they have. And that's how we try to put the picture together. But what kind of bombs do they really have? How sophisticated are those bombs? Do they really work? Well, there what we do is we take a look at their nuclear testing history. Because in the end, what you have to do, you've got to test them uh, to make sure that they actually work. And here are the six tests that the North Koreans have done. The first one, it turns out, didn't work that well. Uh, and, and actually, the Western press particularly, even, even some of the Western uh, analysts, made fun of the North Koreans to say, oh, it fizzled it. And my view was, well, it, it didn't work as well as they wanted, that's for sure. And most of the time, you know, it's technical. You learn more from a failure than you do from a success. And they learn because the next one was good, and the next one was even better. Uh, and then by the fourth and the fifth and then by the sixth, uh, it was most likely like 250 kilotons. Just to give you some idea, uh, Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki were 15 and 21 kilotons. So this thing they tested underground now, you know, was sometime, something on the order of 10 times the overall destructive power uh, of those tests. And, and those two tests, as, as you know, incredible devastation. What made those nuclear tests different, and the Oppenheimer movie sort of got, got that across, but the director, uh, Christopher Nolan, didn't want to go there and show Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And of course, there's plenty of evidence of that. Uh, and and what's, what should strike you about Hiroshima and Nagasaki is not just the devastation, because the United States firebombing of Tokyo uh, was equally or even worse in terms of people killed, it was worse. The difference was Hiroshima and Nagasaki was one bomb, one plane, one city destroyed. So nuclear weapons have not been used since August of 1945. That's what all of our ambition should be, never to have a nuclear weapon used again, because that uh, is a catastrophe. Next. Okay, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So the other way we know things is the missile launches, and they advertise all of that, or their parades, and they advertise that. So I put all of this together from a technical standpoint, uh, again, having been there really helps uh, to, to understand. Uh, and so when people ask me, they usually just ask, how many bombs do they have? Well, that, that's not the right question. The right question is, what are all the different compounds? How much plutonium do they have? And it turns out they don't have that much plutonium. They've had this reactor operating since 1986, and they have maybe 50 kilograms. The Soviet Union, in their days, made on the order, the, sort of the best we can guess, 150,000 kilograms of plutonium. The United States made 111,400 kilograms of plutonium. They have 52. They gave up two reactors in the agreed framework during the Clinton administration. 
that could have made 300 kilograms a year instead of six kilograms or one bomb, which is more or less uh, what, um, uh, what Nagasaki was. So they don't have much plutonium, but the highly enriched uranium that they have brought along since uh, we saw it in 2010, they've got quite a bit of that. But it takes more highly enriched uranium, maybe 20 to 25 kilograms for a bomb instead of six or so. Tritium, this is the hydrogen isotope that you need for a hydrogen bomb. They have very little of that because you need a reactor to make that. Their reactor ha has not run through the whole time of 86, but during the right times of diplomacy, the reactors were shut down. That's good. That means no plutonium, no tritium. Uh, and then how many bombs do they have? Well, we don't know for sure. Uh, I guess somewhere between 20 and 60, enough of this bomb fuel. So maybe let's just say 55. So the important part then is, uh, can they put these bombs or warheads into missiles? And so my uh, analysis right now from everything that we've seen is yes, I think they can put them into the scuds and nodongs. In other words, all of South Korea is within reach of a North Korean nuclear weapon and most of Japan is within reach. And for the life of me, I have to admit, I just cannot understand why, for example, in the United States, generally um, uh, uh, among the population, there isn't greater concern. Uh, also in South Korea here, there isn't a greater concern. It is to me. Can they put one on ICBM to actually reach the United States uh, again, they've demonstrated they have the missile capability, but I don't think they've put everything together and make it small enough, fit it on a missile, and demonstrate that they can do that. So that's, that, that's the bottom line. And from my standpoint, again, the bottom line is the fact that North Korea is one of three countries that can threaten the United States with nuclear weapons, the other two being Russia uh, and China. Okay, so the hinge points and I'll move through them quickly. So first one was in, in 2002, Bush administration killing the agreed framework. Then I'll go on to uh, Obama and Trump. And so here's what the Perry process bought us is Vice Marshal Cho uh, going to the United States, meeting with President Clinton, signing a joint communique, which had the right components. You know, to pledge fundamental improvement in bilateral relations. And then Madeleine Albright you know, came to Pyongyang, uh, not much later. So everything was set up by this time that it looked, looked very promising, but time ran out on the Clinton administration. George Bush won the presidency. Uh, he was enough of a hardliner, brought other hardliners that what happened uh, is they killed the agreed framework. Uh, and the architect of that, he says so himself in this book uh, in 2007 that he wrote, uh, surrender is not an option. Uh, and he said when they found out that North Korea was sort of developing the capabilities, the early capabilities for uranium enrichment, that that was the hammer they needed to shatter the agreed framework because politically, they did not want the agreed framework. They did not want any deal with North Korea. As far as they were concerned, North Korea shouldn't even exist. So they made this decision, and it was a disaster from a technical standpoint. They had no plan B as to what do you do if they open up the facility again, if they go ahead and build the bomb, or then if they go ahead and test the bomb. Well, they did all of those things. So this was a major hinge point. They had no weapons before, in my opinion, and now they built the weapon in October 2006. They tested one. Okay, but it wasn't just Bush. There was another hinge point in that administration. I explained it in the book. Then comes President Obama, and twice he walked away. So the first time he had just gotten into office, he gave this speech in Prague in 2009 about the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. It got him a Nobel Prize. But just before he gave that speech, Kim Jong-il was in power, tried to launch a, a rocket. 
the rock had failed, but it got Obama convinced that you can't work with these North Koreans. That they just, as he put it, they follow a cycle of provocation, extortion, and rewards. So instead of understanding, these guys have a dual track program. They're gonna launch some rockets. What you have to do is make the right decision, see how much risk that you can take. They didn't do that, and essentially, his administration, the whole eight years, never really recovered. This leap they deal in 2012, they, again, they had an opportunity to shut down Yongbyon, an opportunity to get into this centrifuge facility to actually see what was going on, and they missed the opportunity. Okay, then we get to Trump. So when Trump came in, in 2017, now I'd been working, you know, the first time I came to North Korea was 2004, so I'd been working for 13 years on North Korea, and this was a dangerous year from my standpoint. And, you, you know, you've seen these things that Trump said at the United Nations General Assembly that we'll have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. You know, rocket man is what he called him, is on a suicide mission. Kim came right back and said, well, the whole United States is within range of our nuclear weapons. And then they traded these nuclear button uh, comments. So it was a terrible time. But interestingly, by, the, by late 2017, maybe already around this time of UN General Assembly, uh, when Kim Jong-un had successful nuclear tests, successful rocket tests, he started sending feelers that he was ready to talk. And then at the end of the year in December, Trump actually sent feelers to Pyongyang that he was ready to talk. And then with that, the South Koreans ran with that and helped it along to bring about, you know, the meeting of some key uh, South Koreans in Washington, D.C., uh, and then eventually the Singapore summit. And the Singapore summit, uh, some sort of on the right hand of the political spectrum of the United States, but he didn't accomplish anything, Trump. But he did. You know, it, it was very simple agreement, but it had the key aspects. What the North Koreans always wanted was this normalization that had to be put in a document, and they did. And then Kim Jong-un also agreed to denuclearization. So I viewed this, this is a step in the right direction. But then, unfortunately, um, Hanoi came. And of course, so many people, they now recognize that, that it, it was a failure. However, in the American side, that's not what they said initially. So it was indeed a failure, but it failed to some extent. Kim Jong-un made some mistakes, made some big mistakes by not giving his diplomats and his negotiators enough room ahead of time to prepare for the summit. He seemed to be able to think that I can deal with Trump directly, I go to the summit and he can work this out with Trump. But well, what he didn't fully realize that on the American side, John Bolton had come back into the government. Now, looking a little wider, uh, I've got him shown there in the blue circle. So his mustache is white, his hair is white. Uh, and he was determined to make sure that there would be no agreement. So he prepped President Trump that it would be better for him to walk away. And then President Trump had all kinds of political problems uh, at the time uh, to his, uh, related to his impeachment and so forth. So indeed, Trump walked away. And Madam Che, uh, uh, who was uh, vice minister at the time, and Lee Young Ho, who was minister, they had a midnight conference. And they already let us know at that time that this uh, was really a disappointment. And they said, such an opportunity as what the Americans had here may never come again. So we missed an opportunity. However, this is one of the few things where, where Trump got accolades from both sides, the left and the right, said he was right to walk away. You know, he, there wasn't enough offered up for sanctions relief. And my comment, even then, I wrote a piece that said no. He was, it was not right. 
Uh, Kim was angry. He was humilia uh, humiliated. He went home. This was a major hinge point. A and again, from a technical standpoint, they just didn't incorporate these. And by the way, it's not that they didn't know. I've tried to advise our government all along, all of the administrations, it did, because I'm not left or right, I'm scientist, you know, straight down the middle. And so I went uh, and told the Bush administration, the, uh, and, and then uh, uh, after that, uh, Obama administration and then the Trump administration. Okay, so here, here we were. He walked away, and then by October and then December uh, in 2019, uh, you all saw, I'm sure, you saw these photos. These are beautiful horses, and I love snow uh, growing up in Austria, as it turns out. So I thought, but this is, this is beautiful. But it shows from my colleagues like Bob Carlin and others who really understand North Korea, big, big decisions and big changes are ahead, and indeed they were. So then Biden administration came in uh, and they wouldn't answer the phone. So by the end then of January 22, uh, already I would say we can go back to maybe summer of 2021 when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, we could see the changes in, in what the North Koreans were saying, what they were writing, that they were reevaluating policy. And then it looked like what they were doing is making a fundamental strategic change that they would align with Russia and China and forget seeking normalization uh, with the United States. And if that's a case, that's a major, major decision. And you can add lots of things to that. To, you know, for example, uh, here at the 2023 party plenum, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un said we will increase nuclear weapons production exponentially. And of course, you know, exponential, you know, is like this. Well, it turns out he can't just do that exponentially. You can't make more plutonium than that reactor can make, even if it's operating, unless you build a new reactor. That reactor that they showed us in, in uh, 2010 is still not operating. That, that's meant to make electricity. It could be reconfigured. Uh, to make uh, some plutonium, although we would know that if they did it. They have a new ICBM, and indeed they've shown that, the Wasong 18. They're going to launch a military reconnaissance satellite. They haven't managed that yet. But you've probably uh, have seen that November 18th is, is, is going to be a new holiday uh, in North Korea uh, for the missile industry as such. So maybe they'll try to launch one then. Uh, and then he also, from a policy standpoint, said, you know, nuclear weapons are no longer just for deterrence, uh, you know, if one uh, has to use them uh, if uh, the country is in danger. And here is just the numbers. These are the number of missile launches uh, over the years. And clearly, by 2022, they had made a decision. I mean, they're, they're going to go. They're, they're shooting these things off left and right. So then you've put together all the evidence, you know, have they moved towards Russia and China? Well, you, you know, you heard just now, uh, you know, about two months ago. So Kim was up in, in Russia. He got the tour of the Wostochny uh, Cosmodrome. He met with Putin. You can see that they're uh, buddy buddies. Uh, and so things have changed. Okay, I am coming uh, to an end with this. The U.S. government put this diagram together in the newspaper, and what they showed, they said, and we have evidence that the North Koreans are working with the Russians, and they are actually sending ammunitions, uh, you know, to uh, Russia, uh, and they showed this path that goes from North Korea, you know, up the coast, and then inland all the way to close to the Black Sea, to help the Russian unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Okay, so that in indeed, I think they have enough evidence. Some of that is, is happening. That's bad news. But what I worry about is this. What is Russia doing for North Korea in return? 
What you typically hear, well, the, you know, the North Koreans want missile technologies and things of that nature. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, Russians have helped them with missile technologies. What I'm worried about is nuclear cooperation or nuclear transfers. Uh, Kim Jong-un cannot increase his arsenal exponentially uh, unless he gets help from Russia. Russia would never, I never worried about Russia doing this five years ago. I, am, I wasn't worried about Russia doing this two years ago. I'm worried about Russia doing this today because what Russia has demonstrated, it is no longer a responsible nuclear state. And let me tell you, the world depends on those big states being responsible nuclear states. You may not like the fact that they have nuclear weapons. To me, they have nuclear weapons. But if you have nuclear weapons, you have to be a responsible nuclear state. You don't give away plutonium, you don't give away highly enriched uranium, you don't give away test data. You don't, a nuclear test data, you don't do any of that. That's not what you do. And today I'm worried about Russia. So you combine that with Kim Jong-un turning strategically. Now again, this was not just a tactical move because of Ukraine and the fact that he might be able to make some money or get a barter in return from Russia. This was a strategic move that he made before the invasion of Ukraine. Kim Jong-un, he made a strategic decision to do that. So what I'm worried about, this 30-year period of time we had, where we had the opportunities and we missed the opportunities, today they're gone. Our job, and I have to leave that for many of you, the young folks in the audience, how do we get it back? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hecker, for that most uh, insightful talk. Uh, now we're going to, going to move uh, to the panel discussion. So all the panelists, could you please come up and take your seats, along with Dr. Hecker. Well, I can tell right away that I'm outnumbered. <laughs> no, we're all in this together. So we're not taking sides here. Uh, so, well, thank you, Dr. Hecker, for such a stimulating and informative presentation. Uh, dare I say your holistic insights are of great interest to... Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so, your... Your holistic insights are of great interest to, to faculty and students from across IWA. As we can see in the audience, we have a, a large gathering of students from several different schools and departments, but also in our expert panel gathered here uh, on stage, who will be giving their unique perspectives. Now, I'm Brendan Howe, the Dean of the Graduate School of International Studies and Professor of International Relations, and I'm going to chair today's panel discussion. But joining me on stage, we have in order uh, Professor Wong Gong Park of North Korean Studies and Director of the Institute of Unification Studies here at IWA. He earned his MA from Boston College and his PhD in International Relations from Seoul National University. At IWA, Professor Park teaches courses on North Korean politics as well as peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. He previously taught at Handong Global University and before that was a research fellow at the Korean Institute of Defense Analysis. Professor Park has published extensively on East Asian regional security, including about the DPRK's nuclear program, policy responses by South Korea-US alliance, and changing defense and deterrence strategies. He's one of the top analysts of North Korea, and we can see him frequently featured in both domestic and international media. Next on our panel, is uh, Mini Go, an associate professor of political science who has served as department chair and is currently vice president for planning at IWA. She earned her PhD in American politics at the University of Chicago and taught at the City University in New York before returning to Seoul. Professor Go's research addresses issues of inequality, diversity, and sustainability. Her first book, Rethinking Community Resilience, examines how multiple actors' haphazard participation failed to mitigate natural disaster risks 
in the US state of Louisiana. Our third panelist, Leif Eric Easley, is Professor of International Studies at Iwa Division of International Studies. He earned his PhD from Harvard University's Department of Government and was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University's Asia Pacific Research Center, while Dr. Hecker was at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. Professor Easley teaches international security and political economy, economics, is involved in track two diplomacy, and is often quoted on Korean foreign policy in English language newspapers. Among his academic publications are articles in the Korean, science, Korean Social Science Journal about North Korean national identity, in World Affairs Journal about diplomacy with Pyongyang, in Asian Perspective regarding Beijing's role on the Korean Peninsula, and forthcoming in Asian Survey about China enabling North Korea's violations of international norms. Finally, of course, we have Professor Lim Pyun, who teaches international business at Iwa Graduate School of International Studies, but whose research interests have been broadening to other cross-border interactions, from the Korean wave to migration issues. Professor Pyun has, of course, already been performing sterling services on Master of Ceremonies. She has, however, drawn double duty, and so will also be collating questions from our student audience members for discussion by Dr. Hecker and by the rest of our panelists. So I, I would like to ask our panelists for their expert opinions uh, from their own perspectives, their own fields of research uh, on these, these areas that have been raised today. So first up uh, for our panel discussion, Dr. Hecker's book and presentation focus primarily on Yongbyong the primary North Korean weapons site, and the location of several of his visits. I was wondering, Professor Park, in light of your expertise on North Korea's nuclear weapons program, could you speak to the relative importance of Yongbyong versus other North Korean sites and facilities? And what implications does the Kim regime's updated nuclear doctrine have for policy debates in South Korea? and the possibility of future negotiations. All right, thank you, Brandon. Uh, it is my honor to meet uh, the Dr. Hacker in person. Of course, I read uh, your books and that I learned from a lot. And also, I'm very glad that you are successfully coming from North Korea for seven times, as your wife mentioned. So you are the one who actually have a chance to watch very carefully about the Yangbyon facilities and important the nuclear, the, you are watching the whole the nuclear development. By the way, uh, because I'm the North Korean watcher, so I'm briefly mentioning about the North Korean standpoint, what they are pursuing at this moment. You already mentioned that after the collapse of Hanoi, the December 2019, North Korea has introduced so-called a uh, frontal breakthrough line in Korean 정면 돌파전. In English, it's is more a uh, head-on breakthrough line. There are four important elements. First of all, they want to um, the strengthen their ideological struggle. And at the same time, they emphasize the self-reliance. Of course, their ultimate goal is to maximize their nuclear capability. And they are saying that it's going to be a long-term battle. And I haven't seen any kind of a serious challenge of this line or polished direction so far, which means that they still continue to do this this kind of uh, policy direction. But still, I think uh, North Korea will come to the negotiation table at the, uh, in the future with uh, like two conditions, if, if two conditions would be met. First, of course, they are going to maximize their nuclear capability. As you said that, I totally agree with that. The North Korea already uh, completes their capability to attack South Korea and in some part in Japan. But they haven't finished to complete its capability to hit mainland of North Korea, uh, mainland of China, uh, the United States, I'm sorry. And in that sense, I'm you know, carefully watching about the Hwasong 18. If they are successfully developed, the Hwasong 18 is going to be a, a huge the, uh, capability to uh, threaten the mainland of the United States. So I think uh, their ultimate goal is to complete those capabilities. At the same time, I think they are waiting for the next U.S. presidential election, which means that the next year, um, November, right? And then, of course, uh, Kim Jong-un is favors Trump. 
So if Trump would be come back, would come back to the White House, there are high possibility that Kim Jong Un would resume his dialogue with the United States. But um, <clears throat> but it seems to be there are some reaction and repercussion that North Korea has faced. Even though, as uh, the Dr. Heck mentioned, that many people are saying that North Korea is uh, you know have developed their nuclear capability for the past couple of years, but I think uh, they have uh, some serious reaction and some challenges. First of all, you see, Kim Jong-un is uh, making very clear that he definitely wanted to lift up the sanctions, as he asked in the Hanoi summit in February 2019. But I think uh, it's very difficult, even more difficult, to lift up the sanction at this moment, because of the North Korea's relentless pursuit about their nuclear the capability, especially last year, is the highest number of the missile launches, more than 100. So right now, nobody are saying that, oh, so we have to lift up the North Korea sanction for the North Korea. And at the same time, South Korea, United States, strength the our ROK-US alliance, especially in military exercise. Right now, we have a full-scale military exercise. I think it's inevitable because of this very growing the existential threat from the North Korea. And second one is that right now we are seeing the more enhanced cooperation among three countries, South Korea, Japan, and United States. And especially the normalized relationship between South Korea and Japan is possible because of the North Korean threat. You see, South Korean people and Japanese people, they are pretty much agree that they, we have to have a cooperate, have a enhanced cooperation because of North Korean threat. And it's the kind of a very huge challenge to North Korea. And also, at the same time, this, we have uh, many signs that North Korea's economy has been pretty much deteriorated for the past several years because of COVID-19 and, of course, because of the sanctions. So it is inevitable that it is a you know, very huge challenge that uh, Kim Jong-un faces at the moment. So my the final point is that South Korea and United States, of, of course, the uh, international community should maintain the end state for the North Korea's denuclearization, not the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, Joseon, Joseon Peninsula. I think we still have to keep this uh, ultimate end state of the denuclearization of North Korea. At the same time, but we have to, to have uh, some a little bit balanced approach. I mean, it's a deterrence and dissuasion by the audacious initiatives is working well, but I haven't seen any kind of a uh, serious attempt to the dialogue with North Korea. So we have to some balanced the approach. Thank you very much, Professor Park. Uh, some, some very interesting contributions there. Uh, we will give Dr. Hecker a chance to respond to, to everyone's contributions after we, we've heard from other perspectives. I'd just like to segue from uh, one of Professor Park's final comments there about the, the societal elements, uh, because I, I think this also fits in well with Dr. Hecker's holistic approach. The, the Dr. Hecker's book also addresses elements of rational decision making and touches on broader societal considerations when dealing with North Korea. Professor Go, as a, an expert on emergency response and political behavior, can you speak to some of the methodologies for understanding North Korea's nuclear threats, including bounded rationality and inconsistency under uncertainty. Also, as your research addresses gender and minority politics, could you please comment on the role of women and refugees? Because questions of human rights inevitably come up when we're talking about North Korea. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, it is my great honor to uh, join the panel and share my perspective with all of you. Um, I enjoy the book and I strongly recommend you to purchase and read the book. And just to give you a heads up, the central argument of the book is that the U.S. government uh, failed to respond properly to North Korea's dual track strategy, uh, which Dr. Heckel mentioned in his lecture, because some of the U.S. Uh, government officials politicized the issue and amplified the crisis over time. And of course, there, was, uh, there were external situations such as uh, September 11th and the death of Kim Jong-il that made the situation more complicated and out of track. 
But um, besides this hawkishness and misfortune, I think the book makes a very strong case of what could go wrong if we bypass expert opinions and lose track of long-term strategy on complex matters such as denuclearization. Um, although I find that numerous research deals with North Korea's nuclear threat in the context of international and regional security framework, there is little, at least as far as I know, discussion about how political elites uh, process scientific information and incorporate it into their prospective judgments. In that sense, I think that we really need to think about how to better incorporate scientific knowledge into the political decision-making process. This clash between science and politics is becoming more and more common in today's world, and in a lot of cases, decision-makers bounded rationality plays a big role, and by which I mean um, their judgment is limited by time frame, political view, or their own personal interests. In my research, I was also interested in this clash when I was looking at the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in the US. In crisis uh, situations like natural disasters or nuclear threats, there exists this huge gap between experts and non-experts in terms of their perception of the crisis management. While experts are more focused on diagnosing the problem and implementing long-term solutions, non-experts like us or politicians even are more interested in the immediate benefits of recovery or uh, dialogue or sanctions. What non-experts want is um, those pretty much immediate benefits coming out of uh, the talk and what that clashes with uh, what experts want, which is to impose efficient solutions without taking much into consideration various cost and resistance coming out of that non-expert community. So this mismatch is especially detrimental because the threats become normalized. We don't really take uh, nuclear threats or natural disasters seriously in you know, our daily lives. And people focus more on the blame game than uh, the collective risk prevention and mitigation. And furthermore, even though their ultimate cost, as uh, Dr. Hecker mentioned, is exceptionally high, Crises like uh, natural disasters or nuclear threats are low frequency events, and it is very high li uh, highly likely to be politicized. So this seems to be happening a lot even in highly capable institutions like the US government, and I think the important question here to think about for all of us is how to coordinate this scientific knowledge within the bounded rationality of both experts and non-experts. And another thought I had was the source of uncertainties in the bilateral negotiation between the US and North Korea. Um, as much as the US government was confused with North Korea's opaque operations, it is also possible that dealing with changing administrations sent an equally complicated signal to North Korean officials. You saw the changing of uh, presidents and their political parties and according, you know, difference in approaches uh, in dealing with North Korea. So throughout the book, my impression was that North Korea's reaction was not just warmongering. Instead, they li uh, laid out a tactical response to hedge uncertainties coming from the administrative changes by the US government as well as the South Korean government. So imagine you're a North Korean official on, uh, who's lived uh, his entire life in under the Kim regime of you know various generations, and you're dealing with a government that reverses its own promise with a new president. And moreover, if you recall, the 2000 election was a very close call between um, George W. Bush and Al Gore. So this pretty much um, the um, the pres uh, Bush president, uh, the President Bush, uh, pretty much changed the entire course of foreign policy by President Clinton, and that really set the course, like you mentioned, the hinge point for years to come. 
So while foreign, uh, American foreign policy may be more transparent than North Korea, it does not mean that it is also consistent. So the lack of consistency raises serious doubts on the durability of a commitment, which may lead totalitarian regimes like North Korea to seek short-term utility maximizing strategies. And finally, I would like to briefly mention the gender and human rights aspect of the crisis. So the ongoing wars in Ukraine or Middle East un unequivocally show that women and children are the biggest victims of the warfare. And yet, the denuclearization discussion seems to be totally separated from the human rights discourse in North Korea at times. So maybe um, we should really think about how to um, enmesh these uh, military negotiations or nuclear negotiations with the human rights issues. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goh. Uh, Professor Easley, uh, I would like you to, to address a couple of variables. Uh, one that I don't think we've touched on that much so far, uh, and that's the the North Korean identity as a variable in decision making. But the other, which is covered quite extensively in Dr. Hecker's book, The Role of China, uh, but today we focus more on the role of Russia, it seems. Uh, so as a, an expert in Chinese uh, participation in negotiations with North Korea, uh, perhaps you could briefly touch on both of these variables as they play into this this negotiation strategy. Thank you, Professor Howe. I first want to point out, if you look at Dr. Hecker's book, on the back, it says political science, so that the librarians and the booksellers will know where to put your book on the shelf. And I have to say that it's quite rare that I read a political science book and want to see it made into a Hollywood film. So my first question to Dr. Hecker is, which movie star would you like to play uh, you in Hinge Point, the movie? Maybe the, the Oppenheimer sequel. It really is an honor uh, for us, Dr. Hecker, to, to host you here at IHWA. You embody the spirit of Stanford's CSAC. As someone with the knowledge of a scientist and the experience of a track two practitioner, uh, your voice is invaluable. And Hinge Points is a very useful chronology uh, from Dr. Hecker's first-hand experience. Many of my students admire this book because there's value in taking stock of mistakes, especially of one's own government. And it's important, of course, to tell the technical story of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. But the book is more ambitious than that. In evaluating both history and prescribing policy. And that's where I think we can get into some debate. From my own research on North Korea, I would argue we have to be careful about mere imaging, moral equivalencies, and omitted variable bias. I agree completely about the imperative of building trust. But in my view, trust problems with North Korea are less a function of misunderstandings or misopportunities, and more a product of the identity of the North Korean regime. How Washington and Seoul implement their policies is important, but the largest problems emanate from Pyongyang. The Korean War that Pyongyang started may have been fought to a stalemate seven decades ago, but after the armistice, North Korea clearly lost the competition. Apart from nuclear weapons, the North loses out to South Korea's world-class economy and technologies, the ROK military is equipped with better conventional arms. It has a more trustworthy superpower ally and numerous international partners. And South Korea also has growing influence in international organizations and rising soft power. In order to maintain the ruling family ideology in North Korea, its legitimacy and control, North Korea has been unable to follow China's reform and opening to globalization under one party rule, much less sustain engagement with capitalist democracies that would require more rules-based interaction and at least some improvement in human rights. What North Korean identity does instead 
is exaggerate external threats. The Kim regime holds up nuclear warheads and missiles as symbols of national pride, linking tests to national holidays and even claiming nu nuclear weapons identity and its constitution. Deeply internalized identity is sticky and difficult to change. And the identity constructed to keep the Kim regime in power makes North Korea extremely untrustworthy. This identity is in direct opposition to denuclearization. It limits economic and even humanitarian cooperation with the United States and Japan, and it is anathema to peaceful integration with South Korea. That being said, North Korea could be better deterred. It may even be incentivized to gradually change if it were held accountable by all its neighbors. But that is clearly not the case. Witness Russia's arms deals in blatant violation of UN Security Council resolutions. And more important than Moscow is variation in Beijing playing a responsible role. At times, China has focused on stabilizing, restraining, condemning North Korea, convening the six parties, as Dr. Hecker detailed in his book. But it has also been enabling, economically supplying and diplomatically shielding North Korea, even amplifying the Kim regime's preferred identity narrative. What we have seen over recent years is that China's leaders care less and less about denuclearization and Korean unification, to say nothing of human rights, and more about maintaining a strategic buffer and sphere of influence while seeking to undermine the United States. So, in conclusion, as important as the technical aspects and diplomatic missteps certainly are, and this should be required reading on those scores, North Korea's political identity and China's geopolitics are crucial vectors for why we don't see denuclearization. But I want to add and end with trust building, if I may. As untrustworthy as North Korea is, there should be better communication for the sake of risk reduction. And whatever curveballs come from U.S. domestic politics, and perhaps students would like to ask you a lot about that, whatever curveballs come from U.S. domestic politics, I would recognize and recommend Washington's efforts to strengthen trust with Seoul and Tokyo, because trilateral cooperation will be essential for dealing with any North Korean contingency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Easley. Now, Dr. Hecker, I know we've thrown a lot at you. As you noted at the start, you're, you're surrounded by others, but uh, I hope that most of us share a lot with your perspectives, that we haven't attacked you as such, but I'd like to hear what you would have to say to these expert opinions uh, that have been shared with you today. You're going to do the audience questions, is, is that correct? Yeah, thank you. Well, I come to share uh, my findings, what I've learned, my views. But I also come to learn. And, you know, I'm not an expert on Korean Peninsula. I, I know nuclear things and I know them quite well. And I know them uh, around the world. And so I've tried to learn as much as I can about the Korean Peninsula and uh, about North Korea particularly. And uh, that's what I, I share in the book. Because certainly what Professor Easley says is, is important, a national identity and what he traces of the difference of choices, I, I often point out you know, to my students, so, you know, so as you look at these nuclear things, and actually it's a lesson uh, that South Korea must draw from this. So as, as North Korea was developing, essentially you know, uh, along the path that you had indicated uh, of putting 
its effort, you know, into weapons, and then particularly nuclear weapons. So they they made a choice some time back uh, that they would do nuclear weapons. South Korea made a different choice. It would do Samsung, Hyundai's, LG's, and Kia's, and so forth. And just as you said, Professor Easley, let's look at where they are today. Who made the right choices? It's so clear that, that North Korea, so as we say, drew the short straw and made the wrong choices. There's no question. Uh, however, uh, you know, on the technical side, th there's sort of little room for debate because that reactor, you know, makes a maximum six kilograms a year. And if your opinion would be that it can make three times as much, I can tell you that's not possible. Well, on the political science side, of course, it's different. You have all kinds of opinions. People have all kinds of different opinions. Uh, and uh, so uh, I respect your uh, opinions. Uh, I just don't agree. Uh, when it comes particularly to working the nuclear angle into this. To me, as I said before, you know, I'm focused, my life has been focused for a long time to avoid a nuclear weapon ever blowing up again. That is such a catastrophe. Uh, and that means that nuclear powers, you have to reduce the risk of nuclear weapons blowing up. So that comes first. Second. The chance of nuclear weapons blowing up is enhanced or accelerated if you have too many countries having their fingers on the nuclear trigger. So you have to work on nuclear non-proliferation. Don't allow the nuclear weapons to spread. And then what I've been most concerned about for many years that I worked with the Chinese uh, trying to get them to understand uh, is don't let terrorists get their hands on, on nuclear weapons. You know, people in the United States used to think that Kim Jong-un is crazy. He's going to use these nuclear weapons. Uh, that wasn't my view. We found out a lot about Kim Jong-un during the Trump administration. He, he's not crazy. But terrorists might have a very different view. So that's what drives me. And so that's what drives me then in a different direction to say, as I look at all those things, yes, I, I know that the history of North Korea is just as you indicate you know, that it is. But when it comes now to trying to assess uh, is where will they go? You know, I'm driven by the fact that I don't want nuclear weapons to be used. And then based again on my visits, I had this opportunity to learn on my discussions, not only technical people and diplomats, I think there was this issue of they were serious about trying to come to trying to come to accommodation, uh, and then how far the U.S. should go uh, to me is not so much a matter of trust. We didn't have much trust. They didn't trust us. We didn't trust them. It's a matter if you make the decision to walk away, what is it going to cost you on the nuclear and technical front? What is it going to cost you in ever being able to go back, you know, to be able to engage to see whether you can make normalizations come about? So, you know, I'm not a trained political scientist. I've been to a lot of countries. I've been to all the countries that have declared nuclear weapons programs. And sort of that's where my uh, opinion uh, comes from. Uh, so I believe very strongly we had an opportunity. We missed it. Uh, now we have to try to see what we can do uh, to hopefully eventually get it back. So that's a comment in, in that direction. The uh, uh, comments on, on the, the, uh, the issue of um, sort of national identity, uh, of political decision making and so forth, um, yeah, I, I don't deal with the theories of political decision making. I mean, the main reason I don't do, I don't really understand them. You know, I understand technical things. But of course, I've done the, pra I've, I've learned that, experiential learning. And what I've learned, that in Washington, those people that make decisions, they don't have an idea of what political decision making is really like. They don't practice what you teach in class. Yes, 
You know, and I learned at Stanford, uh, at CSAC, from people like Scott Sagan and others, of the theories of the things that you should do, the one step after another. That's not what they do in Washington. You know, and I bet it's also not what they do in Seoul. There are other things that override those nice theories. And so I'm a practitioner. You know, I'm, I'm not a, a theorist. Um, but, but again, very good comments, and I learned from those comments. I guess the one thing I want to come back, because you asked Dr. Park, uh, the question about uh, the, what about other than Yang Byun? And we had a press availability before this session, and I, I was very much also asked those questions. And, and what, what I did uh, in, in the book uh, is, is actually a sort of, I teach a little tutorial <laughs> Uh, about nuclear weapons and nuclear arsenals. And this is what I teach in class. I said, the, the way to look at what Yang Byun means, or what other than Yang Byun means, is that there are three things that you need to have a nuclear weapon, a nuclear arsenal. First, you need the bomb fuel. And we know what goes into that. For uranium, you have to enrich centrifuges. For plutonium, you have to have a reactor. So, so that's what we watch. And that's where Yang Byun comes in. It has, it has all the plutonium at the reactor. There are no other reactors uh, in, in North Korea. So Yang Byun is important. That's where you make the plutonium. That's where you make the tritium. No reactors, no plutonium, no tritium. OK, you can go to highly enriched uranium. As I said, that's sort of, it's not as good a bomb fuel. But you can, you can make some bombs with that. Well, it turns out they did the first major installation at Yangbyon. So that was there also. But there are other facilities. I said that when I came back in 2010. So that's the bomb fuel. The second part is weaponization. You know, in other words, the, the design uh, and all the calculations and the build and the testing of nuclear weapons. That we don't know. We don't know their designs. We don't know their co computer capabilities. So what we do there is we look at the nuclear tests, and that's, that's what I showed. That's why I showed the nuclear testing history. That tells us something. The nuclear tests are done at Pungyi, and you know, obviously not done there. But they're designed somewhere in a nuclear weapons institute. We don't know exactly where that is, because it has no footprint. Uh, but I judge fr from, the, uh, from the test. A and then the third part is delivery. That's where the missiles come in and then the mating with the missiles. And the, so it, it turns out the Yong Byun then is an essential part uh, of the nuclear weapons enterprise. Obviously not the whole part, but it's the one that we can see, that we can watch. We were in there. We had a chance to go back. We missed a chance to go back. As a technical person, I say we missed an opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Hecker. Now, I, I know that we've had quite a lot of student submissions of questions in advance, uh, and Professor Pion has been collating them, uh, to, uh, grouping them together to, to save time. So perhaps, Professor Pion, you could raise the issue with our audience. I'll try to make my answers shorter. Thank you, Dean Hao. Based on the numerous questions asked by our students, I, choose, I chose to call out a couple of uh, questions that do not overlap with the panel discussion. Um, uh, if you, um, I'm going to call, call out also the names of the students who had asked them. If you are one of them uh, whose name is called and would like to state your question, uh, please raise your hand, stand up, and speak to the microphone. Actually, um, I chose two. The first one is uh, uh, from Yoon Seo Kim from DIS. Are you here? Yes, um, she had a question on um, North Korea's sincerity in uh, showing and telling um, Dr. Hecker. And the second one was from Ro Hyunji from DIS. Are you here? Ro Hyunji? Okay. Yeah, so she also had a question about DPRK's uh, uh, possible impact to other potential pro proliferators. So uh, could you uh, stand up and uh, speak to the microphone? That's going to be. Asking right here. Okay, um, I had a question about the um, inclusion of the domestic atmosphere of DPRK when you wrote the book. Uh, you were one of the first to be able to acquire first-hand information on no North Korea's nuclear technology 
and development along with its citizen life environment. Uh, such exclusive information was difficult for the international society to fully grasp before your paper. However, it has the tiniest possibility of the visit being carefully choreographed to seem as such been taken into account. Uh, not only high-ranking officers of North Korea, but also the citizens are intensely, quote-unquote, brainwashed to uplift the Kim regime while being resentful to the capitalist countries, including the US, uh, both intentionally and unintentionally due to their laws and social structure. I find this point to be crucial when gathering firsthand information from a group that has such a culture, and I hope to know if those points were acknowledged when you were writing this paper. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, of course, that's something. When when I first went to North Korea, as little as I knew about North Korea, that's what I expected. I, I expected that uh, there's going to be bias. I, I could probably not believe what I see, and so you have to read the book where I describe particularly that first visit. And, and it was just remarkable uh, of how directly they dealt with me, how professionally they dealt with me. Uh, and, and of course, the other thing that helped, in my opinion, their objective of my visit uh, was actually to try to convince me they have these capabilities. Well, I know nuclear things, <laughs> and so I kept asking him questions, asking over and over and over as we went through all of these, uh, and, and then I got a real appreciation uh, for how forthright they were, how honest they were, uh, and what I surmised then uh, as to what happened is they had clearly thought through my visit. I mean. I didn't want to go to North Korea. My friend John Lewis from Stanford wanted me to go to North Korea and is a very insistent person. Uh, so uh, what they knew, you know, former director of Los Alamos comes to North Korea. This was an opportunity. So they must have, the political people, and I think, you know, Kim Jong-il, must have told his technical people, look, answer hackers' questions you know, honestly, correctly, within a certain envelope. And if he asks too much in some direction, then don't let him go there. And that's exactly what happened. So they answered all these questions. There are some questions I asked three times because I really wanted to know. And finally, Director Lee said, Dr. Hecker, I've already told you twice. I'm not authorized to tell you that. So rather than giving me misinformation and all of that, they gave me the correct information and then they told me when they're not gonna tell me any more than that. And then I was invited back, you know, six more times uh, after that. And so we had developed a relationship that when I finished the first visit, this is, this is really important and I, I write it in the book, uh, Vice Minister Kim Gae-gwan, we had an outbrief after I came back from Yongbyon, and he was really anxious to find out what I had concluded. You know, so I had I had maybe an hour between coming back and the dinner where I gave my my report, and what I told them, uh, Vice Minister Kim Gae Gwan, uh, I'm going to tell you now everything that I'm gonna tell the American government when I get back. And he said, you know, you're a scientist, you tell them what's right, uh, you know, don't add anything, don't subtract anything. And I did that. When I came to the United States, I gave congressional testimony to the Senate. And I wrote up my report for the Senate. And bef as I gave that report to the Senate, we gave a copy to the North Korean mission uh, at, in New York. So they 
had developed sufficient trust in me that I'm going to tell it the way that I see it. And I developed sufficient trust in them that they were not going to try to trick me. And so, and then it was seven years, you know, it, it was uh, quite a remarkable relationship. I mean, there were times when I got under their skin, clearly, <laughs> uh, and they let me know that. Uh, but uh, it, it was, in my opinion, sort of a productive relationship. Thank you. Right, uh, Ro Hyunji, can you stand up? You will be there with oh. the mic. Uh, um, first and foremost, thank you for this opportunity to ask a question, and I really enjoyed the lecture that you gave. Um, from your lecture throughout the Kim regimes, we can see that there was a steady increase of uh, nuclear focus on, in North Korea and an increase of technical developments. So it could be said in that context that North Korea is having a success in development of nuclear weapons. So my question for you is that among countries that have aimed or currently have the intent of achieving nuclear proliferation is, would you say that North Korea's course of action to be exemplary for other countries? And if it is, how big of an influence would their president, president be? <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, and it's one uh, that I worry about uh, a lot. Uh, and, and so uh, certainly uh, other countries uh, were watching and continue to watch North Korea. Uh, fortunately, we have an international non-proliferation regime that works to take away the need for countries to develop their own nuclear weapons. So many countries, today probably 40 or so countries, could build nuclear weapons that have some sort of peaceful nuclear programs, enough knowledge, enough engineering, they could build a, a nuclear weapon program. But they've made the decision it's not worth it. And that's what's so key here. Um, so other countries, and in my teaching, I go through all of the history uh, of what other countries have done. You know, so for example, Iran is interesting. Uh, Iran clearly uh, has a, a program to be able to develop nuclear weapons. They did it back in the Shah's day already. And then what stopped them there uh, was the US government, since we were friends with, uh, with Iran, told them, don't you dare go there. So he, he backed off. But he actually told his people, just get me close in case we ever have to do it. Then the Ayatollahs came and they said, oh, nuclear weapons are immoral. But then they changed their mind uh, after they were gassed by the Iraqis, and they said, okay, let's develop nuclear weapons. So they had developed a program to go there, uh, and, and yet they're still not there today. So if we look at specific cases, the North Korean case hasn't triggered Iran actually turning the switch to go definitely to nuclear weapons. Uh, others, like, like Libya, uh, or Iraq, you know, they they all try, but they never really got close. Uh, and so, uh, North Korea's success does teach them that you know, technically, uh, this is possible. If North Korea can do it, you know, we can probably do it, and Iran, you know, could certainly do it. However, in my opinion, it's also shown North Korea is not a success. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of an international country. It's not a successful country. South Korea is. You decided not to build, even though South Korea played with the idea of nuclear weapons, decided not to go there. You're a success. North Korea decided to go there, and they're not, uh, you know, a success in that sense. That's also the lesson that other countries uh, take away. Thank you very much, Dr. Hecker. Now, 
we're running towards the end of our time, so I want to abuse my position as chair and get in the last question. Uh, but before I do, I want to sum up some of the things that, that I learned from the wonderful book that, that I read and took pages and pages of notes on. Uh, also from your presentation today and from the comments of my fellow panelists here, uh, it seems to me, first of all, that both sides, or all sides, shall we say, are guilty of making bad choices, ending up with bad consequences. So the hinge points uh, point not only at the US, uh, but it also at times at South Korea, also at North Korea, also at times China, Russia, other actors. Uh, secondly, and I think this has come out in the, the discussion we've had here, that both sides, or all sides, are guilty of exaggerating threats of imaging and stereotyping uh, and of seeing themselves in a much brighter light than they portray the other. Uh, and this is why it's not enough to us to take a political approach or a scientific approach. We do need an interdisciplinary, holistic approach to get to the bottom of these tensions. And this leads me to my question, which is, everyone seems to be very pessimistic. Are there any grounds for optimism in dealing with North Korea's nuclear program? I said at the press session, I was asked the same question. I say, you know, we have the saying, never say never. So in the very long term, um, you know, I, I remain optimistic. I mean, the Korean Peninsula, they're one people. Since I, I grew up in Austria, I, I never thought uh, I would see Germany reunited. As I went to school and I was taught all the things, there's, there's just no way. This East German regime and Soviet Union they never come. Well, it, it happened. Uh, and so um, the pessimism right now is, is for right now. Uh, is just, as I had indicated, things have gone in a very different direction. You combine Kim Jong-un's decision, fundamental decision, to go in a different direction with the danger we see, uh, you know, from uh, a non-responsible uh, Putin uh, and Russia. Uh, that uh, gives me uh, the pessimism. Uh, however, uh, you know, in the longer term, you know, my view is... Um, would be uh, be prepared. Uh, you know, in the end, uh, I mean, what we've seen, and again, what I learned from my colleagues like Bob, Bob Carlin, uh, is that the North Koreans are pragmatic. You know, th this is not ideological. Uh, you know, it's very pragmatic. And if the world turns and changes in ways, for example, if, if Russia really you know, fails from a standpoint of Ukraine, and, and other things turn, uh, in the end, I can't see North Korea running towards China for the longer term. That's just not where it's going to go. So there, there is some hope in the long term, uh, but we have to understand that right now we face very different country, different situation than we have, you know, for the last 30 years or so. And so if the door opens, you know, it's going to be opening to a different room in North Korea, and we have to recognize that. So that's what I try to bring attention to the issue. But in the long term, uh, I never give up hope. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the rest of the panel. A big hand for Dr. Ecker and the panelists. And now Professor Pyon will revert to MC duties. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's William J. Perry Lecture. Uh, thank you especially to our wonderful Dr. Hecker. And once again, we're grateful for the support of the Pacific Century Institute and President Spencer Kim. Now I'd like to officially close the event. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you.